Camilla, we're at the most exciting place in the world for you. Labour Party conference surrounded by who you like to describe as lefties. I couldn't be more delighted to be here in a rather wet and windy Liverpool, Kamal. We're at the Labour Party conference. It's a bit more fun for me this year because things aren't getting better, are they, <laughs> Kamal? They're only getting a little bit worse. Rachel Reader's big speech. A little more optimistic, not Slightly. so much doom and gloom. Yes. But we're coming here with Labour not having had a good start to being the new government of the United Kingdom. Why has it all gone so wrong? We are going to be speaking to Jonathan Ashworth, who is the former Labour MP, but also now the CEO of Labour Together. And that's the big question. As I look at that placard, Kamal, saying change begins. Can Labour get their act together? And why does Jonathan Ashworth use a sweary word? Welcome to The Daily Tea, live from the Labour Party conference in Liverpool with me, Camilla Tomini. And me, Kamal Ahmed. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? It is. Over breakfast this morning, can you tell our wonderful listeners what you were reading? I was reading The Morning Star because, as you know, I am a subscriber. Always keep your friends close and your enemies closer, Kamal, is my advice. And as we're in this lefty fest, why not just get fully stuck in with socialism, see whether they've got any good ideas. I know they've tried it before and it's always failed. But, you know, as we're seeing here, change is as good as the rest, Kamal. And I tell you what, this Labour administration really is setting itself apart from the previous 14 years of Tory cronyism and grasping this, isn't it? We are really seeing clear blue or red water between these two parties. Just to be clear to everyone, we do buy our own clothes, which I think is very, very important. Interesting to compare this conference with last year's conference. Last year's conference, actually, people were more excited. The polls were saying Labour was going to win the next election. Actually, Labour is more comfortable in opposition, yes. in protesting. Camilla, you and I went to lots and lots of receptions and parties last night at Labour Party conferences, just like at Conservative Party conferences. There's lots and lots of events um, in the evening, social events where journalists meet MPs, cabinet ministers, and they're really, really helpful for really understanding the mood. Yes. And all the ones that I went to yesterday, they're more nervous now than they were this time last year. And there's a really simple reason for that. Doing government is difficult because in government you have to say no to things mm. and you have to do things that are controversial. And Labour is not comfortable in that place. And Wes Streeting, the health secretary, said at one of the events last night that it is still, though, far better to have one day in power doing something than five years in opposition just talking about what you would like to do. And that is the big issue for Labour. Yeah. This is their activists. This is their fan base. Yeah. These people are very glad there's a Labour government, 4,000 yes. of them. The public, though, Keir Starmer's approval ratings are falling. Labour's support is falling. Tony Blair had a three-year honeymoon. Keir Starmer had a three-week honeymoon. Yeah, they... And that, that is the big problem. Labour find it very hard to transition no. from opposition when they are able to just critique and criticise everything in front of them yeah. and government. Instead, they've ended up at a sort of static caravan somewhere near Blackpool, wondering what's happened. I did say to a Labour MP the other day, you know, you thought you were sort of following up the rear of Keir Starmer on this white charger, like a knight riding to the rescue, and instead you've discovered that you may actually be led by donkeys. You've got winter fuel, which is annoying everyone. I don't care what people say, Labour MPs, lefties, oh, it's OK, it should be means tested. It's a disastrous policy. I think people reflect on releasing criminals from prisons for them only to stand outside jail and say, well, I'm not going to vote Labour for life, was a bad look. We've had a bad look with Donagate. We've got a bad look with Sue Gray wanting to be paid more than the Prime Minister. We've got other people over the course of the weekend now dragged into whether they registered interests correctly. So Rachel Reeves is passing off dresses as office expenses. Can I tell you, Kamal, they really aren't. Uh, Angela Rayne is going on holiday to Lord Ali's apartment and she's registered it as a single trip, but she actually took her very close personal friend, Sam Tarry. We then had Rachel Reeves on the airwaves this morning saying that she had taken a holiday at Richard Walker, the Iceland boss's place, somewhere, I think, on the south coast. 
and she had registered it as an individual, but it was a family trip. Look, you could say this is all just in the weeds and you're, you know, dancing like angels on the head of a pin. But I'm sorry, the optics are terrible. This has not been, this has probably been arguably, and this is reflected funny enough in the Morning Star this morning. <laughs> this has been the most inauspicious start to a government that I think we've witnessed in recent memory, bar Liz Truss. Okay, so we can all agree, and funny enough, it's the anniversary of the mini budget today, Kamal. We can all agree that Liz Truss had a shocker, but this is, this is, you know, when he said things can only get worse, I don't think he meant for his own administration. Do you remember that Keir Starmer said, in a rather sort of pompous way, that he wasn't really a politician? Yes, I think as we if, can all agree as with if, that. <laughs> as if the craft was sort of beneath him, mm. whereas the craft of politics is really hard. It's a mixture of surfing a wave and tying your shoelaces competently every morning. And you have to have that mix of artistry and engineering mm. to be able to be a good prime minister. You have to, first of all, set a narrative. Where are you taking the country? Then you have to set, hang every single policy announcement, everything that you do off that narrative, and you kill everything that hurts the narrative. But they don't have any they policies. Have, well, so they have failed to set a big narrative, yep. apart from things are going to get worse. Yep. They have then failed to put context around things like the winter fuel payment. Now, you may disagree with the idea of means testing the winter fuel payment, but it is a reasonable argument to say you should do. That shouldn't be paid to millionaires. But if you just announce it as a one-off in a vacuum, with no context, no story about why you are doing things. Why on earth would a Labour government come in and decide that it was the pensioners yeah. who were the ones they should attack first? But they it's announced this stuff without contextualising any of it. There mm. were some interesting chats last night at the Spectator Party, which you might find ironic, but was attended by quite a few union types. And I was speaking to a guy from the GMB union, and he was getting into a real state about Ed Miliband's green energy plans and this idea that you can decarbonise the economy by 2030 said it was completely for the birds you know what's going to happen to jobs in the North Sea and that is classic Labour it's coming out with statements like 22 billion black hole and then you say well give us the breakdown from the Treasury no no detail you then get Ed Miliband sort of banging on about 650,000 green jobs without telling us where they're coming from we then talk about green prosperity, but nothing is nailed down. What is it? What are you talking about? Um, it's all sound by over substance, and that's really come back to bite them. And on the subject of Keir Starmer, where is he? Genuinely, I know it's Rachel Reeves' day, and we're going to give our analysis of her speech in just a moment, but where's the Prime Minister? He puts Angela Rayner out on the airwaves on Sunday because he's having a hard time. That looks frit and it looks spineless. I'm sorry, he threw his he, Deputy Prime Minister under a bus yesterday. He's also made a decision. There is a big problem with the way that this government communicates with the public, and we've seen it in the polls. The public are starting to lose faith with this government and faith with their Prime Minister. Keir Starmer did do Laura Koonsberg last weekend, clearly thinking he would he would show his magnanimous team leadership skills by allowing other members of the leadership team to do the start of this conference. Mm. But as you say, Camilla, he should have pivoted away from that as soon as the pictures appeared of him in the Sunday papers at yet another free Premier League yeah. football match. With David Lammy the at problem at, at Spurs time. and yeah. with Sue Gray, the yeah. controversial chief of staff. The problem he has is that, or the problem his advisers have with him, is that he doesn't pivot where necessary. Angela Rayner was not the person to put up yesterday because the whole interview was about her holiday to New York, yeah. her use of dresses. There's a little detail in that whole clothing expenses row, which you've just picked up on, which is that they weren't transparent. They kept arguing, well, as long as we're transparent, that's fine. But Rachel Reeves said that the dresses she received, seven and a half thousand pounds worth of clothing, was for supporting the office of the yeah. Shadow Chancellor. Angela Rayner talked about supporting the office of the uh, Shadow Deputy Prime Minister. They weren't transparent. No. So Lucy Powell on Question Time last week, the leader of the House of Commons, saying, oh, it's all fine because we're yeah. super transparent, we follow the rules. You weren't transparent. And I think that point is almost the most interesting point when it comes to Labour and freebies. 
they weren't straight with the public. And I asked Bridget Phillips and the Education Secretary this on Sunday and I mean she did tie herself into knots because she was like it's all been properly registered and I said it hasn't. And the trouble with Rachel Reeves claiming that dresses are office expenses is of course anybody listening or watching this knows that if you did a self-employed tax return and I said that the dresses I wore on telly were an office expense, I'd get into real trouble. You can't claim tax relief on dresses unless they've got logos on them. And I haven't been minded to put Camilla Tobin's show. We should maybe have a Daily Tea logo and then then could we claim them? Well, we'll be trying. So I said, (laughs) the other trouble is as well, and we've discussed this before on the Daily Tea, it's that, you know, you put yourself on a pedestal and you put yourself a cut above the rest. When you fall, you really hit the ground very hard. It's tiring getting off that high horse. If this was the other way around and the shoe was on the other foot, remember all of the stuff about wallpaper gate and everything else with regard to the register of interest. I mean, the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner was pretty busy in the last parliamentary term. In fact, all of the Tory terms, they were busy. So it's one rule for one and one for another. Right, so... Come I just to- want to make one more quick point. Before we come to Rachel Reeves and her speech, also, lots and lots of this money is coming from one person. Yes. One person who is very rich, Lord Wahid Ali, who made lots of his money in the 1990s through the media and is now involved in ASOS, the clothing company. What is he getting beyond the past that we already yeah, know? Which the Sue Telegraph, Gray granted, we now know. The Telegraph ran a story last week saying that he had demanded new controls on newspapers and oh, how we could cover great. celebrities. Oh, brilliant. And so, however much you argue yeah. that this makes no difference, he has no influence, the fact that he is behind so much yeah. of, these, of these gifts issues means that there must be, in the public's mind, at least a perception that he is getting special access for the support he gives. And the support he gave particularly to Sue Gray's son, Liam Conlon, who received 10 grand from him during the election campaign and is now the Labour MP for Beckenham and Penge. Right, well, come on. coming up next, we're going to be analysing Chancellor Rachel Reeves's speech and we're going to be speaking to former Labour bigwig, well, still a bigwig, really, Jonathan Ashworth. He was the MP for Leicester South and now he's the CEO of Labour Together. So Rachel Reeves has spoken, Camilla. Yep. Uh, we're she... in the media room, which is why it's so noisy. We are, so welcome back. Um, a speech which tried to tackle this issue of there's not enough optimism but actually the vast majority of it was attacking the Conservatives yes. again, which we both think she needs to move on from, the government needs to move on from. Let's just walk through a few of the key points. There was a heckler, a pro-Palestine, um, anti-arms to Israel uh, person or a couple of people who stood up and started shouting. Let's just hear what happened there. They paid the price for their incompetence, their dishonesty and their rule breaking. This is a changed Labour Party, a Labour Party that represents working people, not a party of protest. I actually thought she handled it quite well, really, because she didn't lose her composure. She looked quite strong on stage. I mean, in some respects, she almost seems Rachel Reeves sometimes when she's speaking like she's trying a bit too hard she's a bit robotic she was clearly trying to be as upbeat as possible but to be fair in that kind of school marmish way of hers I think she really gripped that situation she made that point that had been made by Keir Starmer when he was heckled at the uh, manifesto launch that you know we're no longer a party of protest this is change labor that was quite good because that's in line with all of the branding at the conference in Liverpool so I, yeah. she, she, she took she, she, that, she took that in her stride I thought it was actually quite useful for her because it puts the crowd on her side because lots of people started clapping yeah. her and heckling the protests yes um, and also as you say she used exactly the same line as Keir Starmer used at the manifesto launch which is a good line for the public out there. Of course, she's got two audiences. She has the audience in the auditorium 
Nottingham who are Labour Party fans. Yes. They're members, they're um, MPs, they are councillors, they are party workers. But also that line, we are no longer a party of protest, we are here to do things, will work well mm. for the clips uh, in the news bulletins uh, this evening. Yes. And what it does, what it does for them is it it makes them seem to be on the general public side as well as on Labour's side. Yes. Now, I must admit, I did raise a little bit of an eyebrow, Kamal, when she started talking about... I mean, I'm glad to have a bit of her personal history. We've got that her parents were primary school teachers. It's not quite the working-class narrative that has perhaps been spun, but that's fair enough. One could question if her parents are primary school teachers, who, one of whom looked after SEN children, special educational needs why she's introducing this VAT on private school fees, because it's going to affect private school special needs children, but I digress. She made this point about how she's broken the glass ceiling. Let's have a listen to that. In this hall, one year ago, I stated my intention that the next time I addressed you, I would do so as the first female Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> Today, conference, you can consider that a promise fulfilled. 800 years the post of Chancellor of the Exchequer has existed. Everyone a man. On the 5th of July, we made history. Every woman watching this will know, no matter how high you climb, how hard you work, how qualified you are, there will always be moments when you are reminded. Some people still do not believe that a woman can get the job done. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, Kamal, but there still hasn't been a female leader of the Labour Party or indeed a female Labour Prime Minister but there has been three Tory ones. Yes, I think Labour has always had a big problem on diversity not just on gender but also on ethnic heritage. Wasn't it interesting she reminded the audience and of course the public that she has been a member of the Labour Party since she was a teenager in sharp contrast to the Prime Minister, the Labour Prime Minister, who says he doesn't really do politics and, of course, only came very lately to be in oh, the so Labour do you, family. Do you think she was taking I, him on a bit? No, I don't think she was, but I think a couple of messages from this speech. She got the audience on their feet. It was a very... Disagree or agree with the substance. It was a what very substance? good... <laughs> a very good political speech. I think she showed there a much more confident demeanour. I was here this time last year yeah. watching her. She gave a, a reasonable speech at conference before they were already very clearly going to be the next government. Yes. Her speech was confident, but I would say still had an undertow of nerves. I thought today the confidence of being actually in power she held a drinks reception uh, a few weeks ago for a few journalists and we were there talking to her and her team and various other treasury ministers she walks the area in the treasury atrium very confidently yeah the the very trappings of power give you something and i felt from the stage today you really saw somebody who you could imagine if you are a supporter of the Labour side of the political agenda, her as Prime Minister. Yeah. And it's always awkward, isn't it, for the Prime Minister, who is on the stage next to her, next to the podium where she is speaking from, to stand up and clap the Chancellor. Because the relationship between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, at this stage, solid, mm -hmm. let's be very, very clear, but that relationship is one of the most important in government. And for the first time, I watched that, and I could imagine Prime Minister Rachel Reeves. Yes. And I pledge that we would act on the carnival of waste and fraud that took place during the COVID pandemic. Billions of pounds of public money handed out to friends and the donors of the Conservative Party. Billions more defrauded from the taxpayer. More than a billion pounds spent on PPE that either did not arrive or was not fit for purpose. All under the cover of the greatest crisis of my lifetime. On entering government, we found £674 million pounds of contracts in dispute, where we inherited a recommendation from the previous government that any attempt to reclaim that money should be abandoned. The Tories simply did not care. But Labour will not stand for it. I will not stand for it. 
I appreciate what you're saying there, Kamal, about the tone of the rhetoric. And yes, she did get a good applause for that. And it's and it's not a bad policy to appoint a czar to try and claw back some of the COVID fraud money. Having said that, first of all, this is three years too late. I appreciate they've not been in power, but people will think you'll never get that money back. Second of all, I understand this position is going to be held by somebody on a part-time basis, so it can't be that much of a priority. Third of all, it was the only sort of piece of policy or a new announcement in the entire speech. She went over what Bridget Phillipson is doing with breakfast clubs for primary school children. It was, you mentioned the word substance, there was no substance. All it is is soundbite. They have become a party of representation rather than a party of policy. There's no plan beyond talking down the Tories and the legacy that they left them and talking about sunlit uplands, but with absolutely no detail whatsoever behind some of these grand statements about growth and prosperity and jobs. I appreciate she's putting all that off perhaps until October the 30th when we'll get the budget finally. You know, how many times has Rachel Reeves been interviewed and said, oh, well, I'm not going to announce the budget here. You know, we've had all that. But the trouble is, this all looks rather vacuous. There's not much there. You scratch the surface and what do you see? There's no plan. I think she is trying to set a narrative which is, of course, broad brush. Listening to her, the other thing I thought, as well as I can see someone who could be the Prime Minister, I also was reminded of being at Labour Party conferences during Labour governments under when Gordon Brown was yes. Prime Minister. And the whole tone of rebuilding or building Britain, talking about the cranes, the shovels in the ground, this was her attempt to respond to the Andy Haldane criticism about the danger, the former uh, chief economist of the Bank of England, about the danger uh, of talking ourselves into a recession because of the gloomy prognosis mm. of the Labour government. This was their response to them. Let's just hear what she had to say where she was trying. I, I so agree with you, Camilla. It's a little wooden and unnatural. Remember Gordon Brown used to have that weird smile. He yes. put on, he'd obviously been told to put on his face every now and yeah, again. It was slightly frightening, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I felt a little bit of that from yes. uh, Rachel Reeves. I don't think she is as uh, awkward uh, as Gordon Brown's smile is. Her smile is much more natural. But you can tell that she's been told, here, Rachel, you need to cheer up a bit. Yes. And so she puts a smile on, but the tone of building Britain was so reminiscent almost to the words of how Gordon Brown spoke in 2009. Let's hear a bit of Rachel Reeves on, on that. Shovels in the ground, cranes in the sky, the sounds and the sights of the future arriving. We will make that a reality. Jobs in the automotive sector of the future in the industrial heartland of the West Midlands. Jobs in life sciences across the Northwest, clean technology across South Yorkshire, a thriving gaming industry in Dundee, and jobs in carbon capture and storage on Teesside, Humberside, and right here on Merseyside too. Whether it's a good idea, however, to be channeling your inner brown rather than your inner Blair yes. remains to be seen. <laughs> Um, there was a reference kind of, it wasn't by name, he did, she didn't check, name check Tony Blair, but she made that point about how she was inspired by education, 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 that famous speech that Blair delivered 28 years ago. My only observation on that, just as a writer, is I do find it funny that Labour politicians are often referencing that Blair in some way improved their childhood and made them the person they are today. Rachel Reeves is my age. She's born in 1979. I was born a year earlier, so she's the year below me. She left school when Blair came into power. So this extraordinary act of social mobility from comprehensive school to Oxford was achieved under a Conservative government, not a Labour one. I just want to make that little, <laughs> perhaps slightly petty point, Kamal, but I want to, just want to land it there. After these, um, after these speeches, the officials, Rachel Reeves' officials, often come to the media room to engage with journalists, have an argument, uh, have a discussion with journalists, not an argument, have a discussion with journalists about um, uh, what it is she was really trying to say. And I think that 
One thing that came out of that, remember she spoke about the public sector uh, pay increases. Yeah. Wasn't that great that, 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 um, that the Labour government had done that? And just as she was saying that, the Royal College of Nursing uh, announced that, I think it's advisory at this stage, but that they were advising that the nurses turned down oh the 5.5% pay increase for nurses that the government has offered them. So I would say that's pretty politically aggressive from the RCN. Yeah. And in the huddle we've just come out of, where um, Rachel Reeves's officials were saying that this was pro-growth, that we were going to see, what they talked about was the prize ahead. This is the word, there is a prize mm -hmm. ahead, tough yards now, but there's going to be sunnier uplands. They were very careful to say, you must take that up with the RCN. I can't answer for why they did it at that moment, but that's got to be, you must imagine, all of Rachel's people going back into her green room now saying, yeah. well done, Rachel. Oh, did you see the RCN's announcement? I that's going to that's gonna annoy, isn't that's it? That's politics for you. <laughs> but clearly the nurses have looked at the junior doctors and thought to themselves, well, this government's <laughs> looking quite generous. Why have we begin to accept 5.5 when junior doctors have got 22? This is the argument against relentlessly sort of kowtowing to the unions. But that, I think, is a debate for another podcast, Kamal. Um, the other thing I was going to just raise is this, is this having an impact? There's an interesting survey out today. YouGov have just released it. So this, again, was just as she had taken to the stage to speak. One in three Britons have a positive opinion of the Labour Party. Nearly a quarter of those who voted Labour, 23%, describe their opinion of the party now as unfavourable. And again, you talk about unpopularity and the unpopular nature of some of the decisions here. Don't forget that there was booing on the stage this morning in response to the winter fuel allowance. So as we go into tomorrow, the Tuesday of Labour Party conference in Liverpool, I think, yes, OK, they're trying to recover from donor debt. Yes, OK, they're trying to recover from donor gate, but they've still got quite a lot of work to do here, convincing their own fanboys and girls that they're going in the right direction. I think Rachel Reeves has raised the bar to an extent. You could feel warmth towards her. She at last is trying to set out some form of narrative. But I would say now, Camilla, given those numbers you've just shared with us, given the, the approval ratings for Keir Starmer falling, given that support for Labour is falling, given that his Chancellor has given a pretty good performance, Keir Starmer might be sleeping a little less easily tonight thinking about what he has to achieve tomorrow than maybe he was a couple of hours ago. But we'll be back to cover that, of course, with another live podcast from the Labour Party conference tomorrow. But after the break, we're going to be talking to one of the key Labour uh, opposition officials who is now runs one of the most important think tanks for the left, Jonathan Ashworth. And what was that question that we asked that got him to actually swear? Jonathan Ashworth, Chief Executive of Labour Together. First conference for Labour in government for 15 years. OK, give us the good vibes to start us off. How is it feeling? Well, obviously, everybody here is pleased, delighted that we finally got rid of the Tories after 14 years. But the atmosphere isn't triumphant, and nor should it be. You know, we've got a good, we've got a job of work to do in government. It is difficult times, so uh, people want us to be getting on with the job, want us to get on with the job of fixing the economy, fixing the NHS. So there isn't a triumphant atmosphere. People aren't getting carried away. People, I think, are uh, humbled by the scale of the task facing the government, and rightly so. Is it not very celebratory, John, because it's been a pretty terrible honeymoon for Labour? The first 11 weeks have not been great. Winter fuel allowance banning things, things can only get worse, and now Donagate. I mean, be honest, you used to be on the broadcast round all the time for Labour in opposition. If all this was happening to the Tories, you'd be having a field day. Well, I mean, look, let's, let's, let's be honest. It has been a difficult couple of weeks on those issues, and lessons have been learnt, I believe. But I, what I would say, though, is that these are not issues of policy failure. Yes, there's a debate about the winter fuel payment. But there is an argument for getting rid of the winter fuel payment because in the era when 
the pension ratchets up every year in line with earnings inflation or 2.5%, the so-called triple lock, there was an argument whether, about whether the winter fuel payment is necessary in those circumstances. The winter fuel payment was introduced at a time when the pension only went up in line with inflation. Mm. And because that was the 2000s and inflation was so low, people, the Chancellor at the time, Gordon Brown, thought they meant to be an additional top-up. But although there is a policy debate about that issue, the other points that you've referred to, yeah, I mean, look, you know, they've been embarrassing. Clearly, the government has got to learn lessons and get on the front foot. But they're not, pol they're not issues of policy difference. These are things that can be fixed. And I think what you've got to see, what, um, what my old colleagues in the cabinet have got to do, Rachel today, Keir Starmer tomorrow, they've got to start sketching out what their plans are for the future now on the economy, on the NHS and public services more generally. Do you think it was right that Keir Starmer said things are going to get worse before they get better, given that the voters voted for a new Labour government for things to get better? So this gloomy tone has been seen by the public. His approval ratings have collapsed. Consumer confidence is down. He's actually in danger, as Andy Haldane, the former chief economist at the Bank of England, said, of talking us into a recession. Well, I think he's got to be honest with the British public about the scale of the challenge ahead. I think the days of phony promises and harebrained schemes, they have that, the public had that in spades under the Tories. So I think he's got to be honest with the British public about how difficult the journey ahead is going to be, that there are going to have to be tough decisions. But you are right. I think my colleagues in the Cabinet have got to sketch a picture of where we are going and what that means. That there is a better and brighter day ahead. And I think that's what we'll see today from Rachel Reeves and what we'll see tomorrow from Keir Starmer. Because people do want a bit of hope. Look, there's something I would say. Look, if you can, it, it, there's a reason why in, 90, in the 1930s the most popular Hollywood movies were Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and all this, those screwball comedies. People want hope. They don't want everything to be miserable all the time. There's a reason why, uh, in that very that very difficult period, people flocked to those movies, uh, and because they, they wanted to, they wanted they wanted that uplifting spirit. So I think you'll see today from Rachel and and Keir tomorrow more of that about where we are going and, and how we can turn a corner and where we can get to if we stick to the course. Well, we're all certainly singing in the rain today, John. It's been soaking outside in Liverpool in the docks as we made our way in. I'd like to ask you a question, though, because I referred earlier to you being the Labour attack dog during the election yeah. campaign. You know, you really put yourself out there. In fact, you put yourself out there a lot during Jeremy Corbyn's tenure as well and tried to hold the end up for the more sort of sensible, moderate wing of the party. Fair play to you. Where was Sir Keir Starmer yesterday? Why on earth did he decide not to do that beginning of conference interview with the BBC that he always does, or the Labour leader does every year, and put Angela Rayner out there, his deputy, when she had just been absolutely hauled over the coals by the Mail on Sunday, talking about her claiming holidays and all. It's, we've gone from two tier Keir to not here Keir. Where is this bloke? Well, he was on Laura Coonsberg, I think, three weeks ago. Yeah, but not, not, not on Sunday, the start of the conference. Why is he running scared? He's not running scared. He was on Laura Coonsberg. Is it, was he at the football? Where is he? <laughs> I don't know where he's on. I, uh, I have been relieved of all kinds of responsibilities, and I certainly have never had the responsibility of being the uh, of Keir Starmer's diary secretary. So, <laughs> no, so I don't know where he was. But he was on Laura Coonsberg three weeks ago, and he will be doing media this we week. He'll be really out and about. He may yet, even John. appear on the Daily Tea, who knows? Well, I'm, hell may freeze over first, Kamal, we hope. <laughs> I, well, who knows whether the Prime Minister will grace us with his presence, but Camilla makes an important point. The communication of things like the winter fuel allowance, the fact that you weren't able to deal with freebies and how were you going to uh, kill that story, has shown that there is not a narrative from this government. The, the thing that Tony Blair proved when he got into power in 1997 with Alistair Campbell and all the people around him, however brutal that was, there was a story. And what people have not got from this government, and that's why you've seen your poll numbers dip so dramatically after the election, you have no big story. The winter food allowance has no context, as you have said. Might be a good policy. I actually think the policy of means testing benefits is probably a good one. But there was no narrative about why you were doing it. You just announced it in a vacuum. With the freebie row, I think you've got a real problem with the public. You've been doing things and getting things that general members of the public can't get. And the point that you made, and Lisa and Andy made to Camilla and me, was that we were like our voters. And what the free dresses and free suits and expensive glasses proved to the public, you weren't like them. 
don't you, Jonathan, need to get a grip of the story you're trying to tell the public? Because at the moment, the public aren't hearing it. Well, I tell you what, I think one of the, misnom the biggest misnomers in politics is that you uh, campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. That's not true anymore. You've got to govern in poetry as well. And what I mean by that is, you don't govern based on spin and chasing headlines, but you've always got to be explaining. And the voters want to hear what, uh, decisions for, uh, the, the, the reasons for the, the decisions you're making. You've, every minister needs to be an explainer in chief. And putting out there that story, that narrative, uh, drawing the thread between different decisions and explaining how it all hangs together. So I think it is a fair criticism, the point that you are making, that you know we are, we, my colleagues are not out there uh, explaining it as much as they should be. But it has been the summer, to be fair. you know, and, and, and in summer, as we know, the parliamentary, the political cycle always sort of you know peters out over the summer. So we have had the summer. The conference season is always the start of a new political season. So you will, I think, so the new, you know, yeah, the new political season, that's what where the conference season uh, begins, doesn't it? So I think you will see more of that. But look, you know, these last few days, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to take your listeners for fools. Of course, it's been challenging. But as I say, you've got to be explaining all the time. So it's that you campaign in poetry and you govern in poetry. Could you just tell us a bit about Lord Ali? Do you know him well? What's he like? He's been in the headlines along with Sue Gray. What's she like? Just for our audience, because they're not familiar with these people on a personal level. They've been in the headlines a lot. Can you tell us anything about either of them? Um, well, I know both of them. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I, I know both of them. They're both hardworking, decent people. Um, uh, I, I've <laughs> never, I've never benefited from any uh, free. Is that, is that yours? Did you buy your suit, uh, John? I, I did buy my own suit. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, yes, <laughs> I've never benefited from any free clothes or anything like that. But no, I mean, what Wahid Ali is committed to the Labour cause and has been all his life. He's a successful business person and he wants to support Labour and he wants to see Labour get into government. That's all he's interested in. Mm. That's why he's been involved in the Labour Party. That's why he's been involved in fundraising for the Labour Party. And, and he's a decent, hard-working, successful business figure. And Sue Gray's a help to Keir Starmer and not a hindrance at this stage, sure. having demanded more pay than the Prime Minister? Of course Sue Gray's a help. She's a, a first-class um, chief of staff. She knows Whitehall inside out and she is an important part of the Labour government. Just tell us what Labour Together does. What's your role now? Obviously, you must have been so disappointed on election night after all the hard work you've done, after all the hard year, yards of opposition, to not to slightly miss the prize at the last moment. Must have been like a trapeze artist oh, missing, missing the, the bar for the last jump of the Olympics. But what does Labour Together now do to help Labour develop the kinds of stories that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Well, first of all, how disappointing was it, and how oh. hurt? How hurt were you by that? Oh, it was a right kick in the bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to say that on the yes, Daily? Oh can. yes, we're you very we're very robust on the Daily Two. Can, can you bleep that out? A bit no, like on, no, we don't on that want Jeremy Beadle show back in but, the 80s where they used to bleep out the swear words. Was it horrifying? Are you were surprised on the night? Uh, look, I mean, look, nobody wants to lose, but particularly when uh, you've worked so hard. And I'm very proud of the work that I did to help Labour get elected after 14 years. Nobody wants to lose when you know all your colleagues are going that way and you're going that way but in the end in my constituency of Leicester South it was Gaza yeah. it's as simple as that and the new MP you know in his victory speech said it was for Gaza of course he's got zero impact on the developments in the Middle East he's got no influence on the developments in the Middle East he won't be able to deliver for his constituents either because he's, he's a, an independent MP sitting with all the other sort of odds and sods and they are sort of sinking without trace in Parliament, actually. Mm. So I feel, I just feel really sad for people in Leicester who are struggling to get decent housing or who sometimes are exploited in some of the sweatshop uh, 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 factories we've got there or are struggling to get an operation in the NHS. They needed a Labour MP fighting for them. Yeah. But look, that's politics. It's a rough game. You take the rough, you take the rough with a smooth in politics. Uh, uh, but what does Labour Together do? We're a think tank. We're thinking about how Labour wins the next general election. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, we do a lot of polling, but we're also thinking about what the policy agenda should be for the next manifesto, and, and if we if we can win the trust of the British people for a second time, the policy agenda for that next uh, for the for the second term of a Labour government. We're doing that thinking now. There was some thinking in the past that you know a two-term Labour government was a given. I mean, was that overly complacent? What are you thinking now? Is it a guarantee for 2029? No, not remotely. In fact, we we produced a report just on Friday 
pointing out how fragile yeah. the voter coalition is that propelled Labour into government. And a big chunk of Conservative voters switched to Labour, many, in many instances for the first time. I bet many of them Telegraph readers and Daily Tea listeners, and they switched to Labour because of the state of the economy and the NHS. Labour has to really deliver on the economy and the NHS, as well as on other issues like dealing with illegal migration, because we are on we are on probation. Yeah. You know, we, this is not. They have not given us a blank check. They want us to deliver. They want us to get on with the job. They want us to prioritise their priorities, and that's what we've got to be talking about this week. Do you worry, uh, Jonathan? Just to go back to the Leicester South sectarianism and single issue campaigning is not actually what voters want as you say voters have to be about what's my local hospital like what are my you know roads and schools like but this sectarianism there's been lots of particularly female Labour candidates who were bullied and barracked and shouted at which you'll have heard all the evidence uh, from that are you worried by that well first of all what is happening in the, in the Middle East is horrific and it's entirely understandable and quite right that people will feel strongly about that. I'm never going to criticise voters for feeling strongly about people losing their lives in the Middle East. All I will do is point out is that foreign policy has changed on the UN funding for uh, uh, the, the aid agency in Gaza, on arms sales. Whether, whether people, we can have a debate about the rights and wrongs of that, yeah. but British foreign policy has changed because we have a Labour government, not because of we have independent MPs. But the second issue, yes, there is intimidation on the streets. The, the campaign that uh, uh, many of us faced was vitriolic and horrible. Um, anonymous leaflets went out accusing me of being uh, sort of pro-genocide mm. uh, 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 and so on. You've all seen, of course, some of my colleagues, the way they were barracked at their victory counts. There were videos going around of me being hassled and chased in the street in a very, very intimidating way with people putting their iPhones in my face, literally in my face, and shouting and shouting at me non-stop for 40, 45 minutes. This is not what po our British politics should be about. We've got to stand up to this, and I will always stand up to it. And I bet you, I'll tell you something, when this goes out on your social media channels, there'll be people having a go at me, there'll yeah. be people shouting at me on social media, but intimidation and bullying. I've stood up to it all my life and I'm not going to give up standing up to it just because I lost my seat in Leicester. Good man, Jonathan Ashworth. Lovely to speak to you at the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. Fantastic, Sorry, Jonathan. Commander. Thank you, you so much. No, no, no. That, I'm just saying yes. I'm just agreeing with you, Thank brother, you so as much. always. And uh, you've got a busy day ahead yep. as CEO of Labour Together, so good luck with everything you're doing over the course of the next three days. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you very much. The great thing about Jonathan Ashworth at Kamala is he does speak human. I mean, that's why he was on the broadcast round, because you could ask him a question and he wouldn't. It's good to speak to people sometimes outside of the cabinet because they can give you a bit more of an honest view. Much more. And not the party line, which yeah. is refreshing. Yeah, much more. The point about him is that the public can understand him. And also, when you say speaks human, it means he's honest. He yeah. actually gave us honest answers around there is too much division in. Um, how, what story are people uh, telling? He talked about they needed an explainer in chief. All the responses to the donation of dresses and spectacles and apartments in New York for people's holiday have all been slightly different and have all been slightly awkward. It's that lack of grip that is one of Labour's biggest problems. All right, so Rachel Reeves' day is done. Keir Starmer's big day is on Tuesday. We'll be back 5 pm to cover it all.